I'm Lynn and welcome to my Capturing the Light watercolor demonstration. This is my favorite lesson to teach. Light and shadow are the one element that to me brings the emotion to a painting. I can walk down the street and see a scene day after a cloudy day and it doesn't speak to me at all. But let the sun come out and get strong cast shadows and bright sunlight and all of a sudden it's just aha. So when we're talking about light and shadow, it's important to remember that light and shadow are not the same thing as light and dark. Light and dark refers to how light or dark something is compared to black or white. And it's an important element of composition and design, but it doesn't bring the emotion. Light and shadow bring the emotion. Light and shadow refer to the areas where the sunlight is hitting an object or where it's in shadow. So interestingly enough, something that's a white object in the shadow could be painted dark, while a black object in the sunlight would be light because it's part of the light shape. So for this exercise, I'm only going to paint the shadows. So for this exercise, I'm only going to paint the shadows. It's important to pick an image that will break down into two shapes. One's going to be the sunlight shape and one's going to be the shadow shape. Architecture is a good choice since it breaks down into planes pretty easily. I haven't done my drawing yet because first I want to be sure that the photograph will work. To do this, I make what I call a shadow map which is sort of like an old school thumbnail drawing, but it's a whole lot easier. I already know I'll need to do some editing. There's a lot of what I will call visual clutter here. And what I mean by that is extraneous visual information that confuses rather than contributes to the composition. In this case, I'll plan to remove the fence I'll remove this bush here, these leaves up here, and this downspout. Um, I'll also ignore the shadows on the railing. Um, since we can't see what's casting them, in general, it's better to leave shadows cast by unseen objects out because they can be confusing. To make my shadow map, I will lay a piece of tracing paper over my photograph. I'm going to mark little registration marks on the corner just to keep myself straight. And I'm going to volume in the shadow areas with the side of the pencil. I'm not going to worry about values within the shadows. This is just a yes, no if it's shadow or if it's sunlight. As I'm doing this, I notice a conundrum happening up here. And that is that my roof is part of the sunlight shape and by logic, so is my sunny sky. But um, if I don't draw an outline, which we know is a really big no-no in watercolor, I don't have any way to separate the, the roof from the sky. So. I have to pull out my artistic license here, and I'm going to decide that the sky is going to be part of the shadow shape. I just think it'll make better design. I've got my shadow map completed. A good way to check my composition is to see if it works as an abstract design. And the easiest way to do this with any painting for me is to look at it upside down in the mirror. That takes the subject matter completely out of the equation. So here it is upside down and backwards. If it doesn't work and I can't make any adjustments to turn it into good design, I'll have to choose a different photograph. But to me, this works. So now I can do my drawing. So here's my drawing, and you'll see, not only did I draw the house, I drew the profile of all the shadows as they are on my shadow map. 
And that's because once I get started painting, I don't want to have to scratch my head and wonder where the shadow is. I've got it all where it needs to be. I'm going to put a little bit of masking fluid up on this edge, but that's the only place I'm going to use masking fluid. You'll see some X's on this, and to me, that's my own notation that that's an area that won't get any water and any paint. And I do that whenever I paint, because then when I'm just frantically wet and painting, I don't have to stop and scratch my head and wonder. You'll also see a couple of G's. And to me, that refers to a bounced glow within the shadow. And shadows are generally cool. And this painting isn't going to have any local color. And the only thing I want to paint are the shadows. So wouldn't it be fun if within those cool shapes, I find a couple of warm areas? And I will talk to you in a moment about what that means. But right now, we have to think about placement. Because this is going to be an entirely cool painting, those couple of areas of gold are really going to grab your eye. So I don't want them to be in the dead center or on either of the four corners. So I've decided to put one up under this eave, and I will put a secondary one under this eave. Watch the bottom of the paper towels. That's bounced glow within a shadow. Okay, so I'm ready to start my first layer of paint. I'm going to use the three primaries, and the three that I've chosen today are Alizarin Crimson, Thalo Blue, and Cadmium Yellow Light. You could substitute Hansa Yellow for the Cadmium if you'd like to. I chose the Alizarin and the Thalo Blue because they're both good, strong colors. They're transparent, and they stain. So that's going to work really well for multiple layers. I'm going to replicate a thin veil of mingled color that's my shadow map onto my painting. I'm not going to worry about light shadow or dark shadow. I just want the yes, no, is it shadow, is it not. I want the color to mingle because if I'm working with three primaries and I blend them all together. I've got gray, but if I layer gray over gray over gray, I've lost the real opportunity for excitement. So I'm going to be very judicious with my yellow. That's what will turn this into gray, but I'm going to put a veil of mingled color over all the shadow areas. I'm going to begin with a bounced gold because my paper's clean, my brush is clean, my palette's as clean as it's ever going to be. And so it's a good time to start with that gold. I've got to do the gold wet because I want it to be a glow. I don't want it to be a headlight. So I'm going to wet the area of the gold and a little bit beyond it. I'm going to make the gold by using my cadmium yellow and bringing just a little bit of alizarin crimson into it. Not quite that much, but enough to make it more gold, less yellow. And I'm going to diffuse a little bit of that into this area under the eaves. I've then got to surround that with something. And if I surround it with a blue, it's going to turn green. If I surround it with a blue violet, it's going to look like a headlight. I don't want this to be either headlight or murky. So I've got to do a little bit of a buffer. And my buffer is going to be red violet. So it's just the blue and the red balanced towards the red. This is a good safe buffer to surround this glow with. And this is show you why it's important to do it wet. I just want it to bleed in. When I move out away from that, I can go into any of my mixed shadow color mixture I want because I've got my safety around the gold. You'll notice when I go around these windows, the shadow moves up and down, and it will as it goes around an object that 
sticks out in profile. So at this point, I'm not caring too much exactly what colors are mixed into this. I'm just looking for it to be interesting. If it starts to feel like it's getting all too much the same color, I'll just vary the proportions a little bit. Probably going to get a little bit of a backwash here because that's started to dry, but that's okay. I've got plenty of layers I'm going to put over top of it. The inside of the windows here is in shadow because the sunlight is my light source and this is inside so the sun's not hitting it. I'm looking for a consistent value from light to dark, but it's not always going to happen. But at least I can aim there. So I've come to a good stopping place. This is a good time to do my second gold. Again, I've got to wet that area. It's a little tiny gold, so I don't have to wet too far. Drop a little bit of it in. Surround it with my red violet as my protection. And then I can continue on with whatever shadow color I want. And I never worry about this looking too brightly colored because I'm going to put layer over layer, and if we layer multiple times on top of three primaries multiple times, eventually we'd work down into gray. So it would be much better to have this being a little bit too bold than a little bit too blah. I think we'll end up here. I'm going to turn this upside down. I'm going to turn my shadow map upside down so I can see where I am and just continue on. And I've made all my yes-no decisions on my shadow map, which makes painting this pretty easy. Here's that little bit of masking fluid I was talking about. Ah, well, I've got it upside down. I might as well do the sky. Now, I am not looking for accurate local color here. I'm looking for strong design. So I'm going to make it a point to not make a blue sky. I just want to keep the colors in the cool quadrant. See, maybe I'll let my sky shift to a little bit of green. That would be fun. If there were green trees back here, I probably wouldn't do this. I would make them be maybe purple. Because I'm not looking for realistic color. I'm looking for strong light and shadow design. Still referring to my shadow map. I'm just filling in everything that's on the shadow map. If I get tangled up, I can always go back to my photograph, but in general, I'd like to use my shadow map as my reference. Got the light coming from this direction, so I can cast a shadow on this side of the window and underneath, but I won't put one there.
the color is looking a little too much all the same to me, so I just make it shift a little bit. Now I'm going to pull this shadow over the entire area. I'm not going to separate porch from column from house sitting behind. It's all part of this one shadow area, so it all gets the first layer of paint. I will separate these areas with the rest of the coats of paint. But right now, it's just a yes, no, I'm making my shadow shape and I'm leaving my sunlight shape. And I'm looking for this to be a thin veil of color. If I was working larger than this, I would probably wet this area, but because this is a quarter sheet, I feel like I can handle it all with one, one coat dry. If I couldn't, I would wet the area first. Now, just for fun, I think I'll let this shadow start to turn a little bit green. We've got a little green up there. Maybe I'll pull a little bit of green down here. If I don't like it later, I've got a lot more layers to go over top of this, so I can completely get rid of it. Again, I go from back of porch to column to the um, overhang all in the same layer. I've gone a little bit over my X's here. Let's see if I can rescue that before it dries. Now notice something else that I did because it turned green here. I let the green extend behind that column a bit as well because it would be an awfully convenient shift there that it just happened to change color behind the column. So I won't let that happen. Same thing behind this railing. If I'm a little green here, I need to be a little green there, or it will be less believable that I'm looking behind it. Keep referring to my shadow map. Because I'm working on a slant, I'm getting a little bit of puddling at the bottom. That doesn't bother me, but if it feels like it's going to run, then I have to lift it up with a thirsty brush. I'm not being super careful about how I paint around these pickets because I know I've got a lot more layers to put on. And because sitting and watching me paint super careful would be really boring. Okay, got a little shadow under each step. I've decided to simplify this area and just make it an open area in shadow.
a little shadow that hits the railing here, which I didn't quite allow for, but I'll put it in. And I've got another one right here that I somewhat painted myself into a corner, but that's okay. I think I can get a place to put my hand. All right, so unless I've forgotten something, oh, I see a little something I forgot. The shadow under the roof, under the edge of the roof here. And it's a little tiny shadow, sort of inconsequential, except it adds a little bit of zing. And the inside of these windows are also in shadow. So, unless I've forgotten something, that's my first layer of paint. It's the same thing as I have on my shadow map, and it's time to go to the hair dryer. So my first layer is dry, and it's a replication of my shadow map. So I don't need my shadow map anymore for layer two, so I'll set that aside. And I'm going to use my photograph as my reference. It's not going to be a literal reference, though, because as you can see, this is pretty much all just mid-tone gray, and the shadows don't have a whole lot to do with the form, but I'm going to use the photograph to check the form of the house to see how I'm going to structure my layers. I'm going to walk myself visually through this, um, this first layer, and see what needs to protrude forward. If it wants to protrude forward, it's not going to get any more paint on it. And I'm going to put a little X, just like I did with the whites. The X is going to remind me that I'm going to leave it out. I think this eave would be nice to project forward. I think this little roof would be nice to project forward. I think the eave under here, and especially this front porch. I want it to come forward. So I'm not going to put another coat of paint on anything I've made an X on, but I will put another coat of paint on the rest of it. I'm going to use the same color combinations as before and just glaze right over. I'm not going to pay any particular attention to what color goes over what color unless I have a good reason to. I'm going to start at the top. It's a little easier. I'll turn it upside down. That way, with a little luck, I won't run my hand through wet paint. I'm doing this dry, but um, depending on size, you could always wet an area. Ooh, that's bright. Soften that down a bit with a little bit of water. Again, I'm not paying any attention to realistic color. Let's see. Let's get another layer. And inside of these windows. For here, I decided I'm going to leave that out, but I'll put another coat on this. If I see a color getting a little too much the same, I'll just mix up my mixture a little bit. I'll vary it. The last thing I want is for the color to be boring. I'm looking for mingled shadow color. Down here, I've decided I want this roof to project forward. So I'll put another coat of paint on what is not under the eave. I'm using a red violet here because I'm adjacent to that glow 
and I would like it to not get muddy, so I'm using my safety color again. This is just a thin veil, nothing too heavy. Oops, that was too heavy. <laughs> Because I can do many, many layers, I'd always rather it be a little bit dark than a, or a little bit light rather than a little bit dark. I can always darken it. Come down under this porch. I want the porch to project forward, so I'm going to put another coat of paint on what's behind the porch, but not on the columns and not on the soffit. So you can see, you'll be able to see that by leaving those out, the columns project forward. If I looked at the photograph, they're all the same value. But that value contradicts the, the structure, so I'm just using my photograph as reference for the structure. And you should see the columns and the front of the porch start to come forward. Now, as I'm approaching this green, I have a decision to make. And that decision is if I like this green or not. If I think it's an accent or I think it's a distraction. If I think it's an accent and I really like it, I'll put more green on top. If I think it's a distraction, I'll put a red violet on top to neutralize it because red and green are complements. I think it's neither either. I like it both ways, so I'm just going to put a blue over it. This is one of the only color considerations I'm making, whether I want to have something become more prominent or have it become less prominent. I think I'd like to leave the little bit of green that's, that's hanging in here, but I think this is maybe too much, so I'll just use a, a blue-violet. Again, I want to pull that same color behind the pickets so that I, I feel like I'm looking through the fence to see what's behind, or through the pickets to see what's behind. A little too much pigment, and water will fix that. So you can see that with this second layer, I'm starting to show you a little bit more about the form of the building. So I'm going to continue with this thinking process for more layers. Each one's going to get smaller, darker, and add more definition to the form until I've reached my darkest darks. I'm going to show you a close-up of an example of this process. I've got a white house. It's got white trim. I'd like to be able to separate the trim from the house, but I don't want to outline it. So I can separate it by adding a second value on the house, which separates it back from, from the trim. This window steps back a bit, so I'll put another coat on it as well. 
Same thing here. And over here. So I'm beginning to develop form by using thin veils of value rather than outline. So thanks for watching. I hope to see you in a workshop sometime and happy painting.